The Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC, is one of the most important climate systems on Earth and a key indicator of the health of our ocean. But is it in danger of decline? In this special mini-series from the creators of the National Oceanography Centre's Into the Blue podcast, we speak to a range of experts to get to the bottom of the AMOC's potential decline and what we can do to stop it. Enjoy today's episode. Hello, I'm Dr Zoe Jacobs and this is our final episode in the series all about the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, uh, more commonly known as the AMOC. Um, and I'm very excited to be joined by Professor Penny Holliday today to discuss all the AMOC related research that we undertake at NOC um, and talk about what the future holds for observing it. So Penny, thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be here. Thanks, Zoe. I also really need to congratulate you on being awarded this year's Challenger Medal, which has recently been announced. That's quite an achievement. It is. It's uh, totally amazing. I was really bowled over when I got that news. It's fantastic. I'm very, very honoured to to be given the award. Yes. Yeah, I can imagine. Huge congratulations. Um, so, yeah, it's been quite a year for you so far, hasn't it? Because you've also taken over the role as, of uh, Knox Chief Scientist, which sounds terribly important. Um, <laughs> so I wondered if you could tell us a bit about what that entails. Yeah, it's quite simply, it's been the scientific lead for, for NOC. Um, mm. And so that means evolving the NOC strategy and leading the delivery of the data science and technology part of our um, of our research program. Uh, so it's also about um, being a sort of a science ambassador for NOC, mm. working with experts external organisations yeah. to sort of fly the NOC flag and and uh, look for ways in which we can work with people to deliver the impact that we're aiming to deliver. And it's also, I think for me particularly, about um, developing a sort of supportive and inclusive culture in NOC. You know, we need a, a good set of diverse a diverse set of people in the organization to deliver the research and impact that we want to so we want to make our working culture sort of supportive and inclusive and a place where people can really thrive and develop their careers and their skill set yeah absolutely um and i'm sure you're going to do a great job of that so good luck <laughs> <laughs> um so we found out in previous episodes in this series that the amoc is incredibly important for a whole range of reasons um so how much amoc research has actually been conducted at knock over the last few decades yeah well it's a it's a topic of research that's been around at knock for quite a long time um the the amoc is important not just because it's an interesting thing in the ocean but mm. because of the heat that it transports mm -hmm. around the globe so it's a really important part of our climate system mm -hmm. and understanding how it works uh, is key to understanding how it's going to evolve in the future under climate change and so for many years NOC scientists have been trying to understand what the AMOC is and how it works. And in past decades, the way we've measured the AMOC or um, produced an estimate of how strong it is, is just using ships. Mm. So you would um, sort of set off at one side of the Atlantic Ocean, drive along to the other coast, and every 30 miles or so you'd mm. stop and, and take some measurements of um, the temperature, the salinity, and maybe the strength of the currents, mm. the velocity as well. Um, but that was a very slow process and it only gives you a snapshot of what the AMOC is doing at, in, in those few weeks that yeah. it takes to, for you to cross the Atlantic. And so um, uh, in the early part of the 2000s, we were able to show that there was another way to measure the AMOC and that was to use moorings um, and I'll explain in a moment what a mooring is and just in a few places really in the edges of the, the, the main two ocean basins of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, a more, and, and if you make the measurements just in those few places, you actually can come up with a, an, an, another way of estimating the strength of the AMOC. And what's really brilliant about that is that you can leave the moorings there for a long period of time, a year, two years, or even longer, so that you can have continuous measurements of how the mm. AMOC is changing. And a mooring is quite simply um, a rope that's anchored to the seafloor, stretches up to the surface, and you have scientific instruments um, sort of attached to the rope at various steps all the way to the surface. And if you have a few of those over on the Western Atlantic, a few in the middle around the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and a few more on the east of the Atlantic, you get this continuous estimate of the variability, the strength and the variability of the overturning circulation. Wow, that's really cool. Um, thanks for explaining that in such good detail, actually, it's really helpful. Um, so is that kind of set of moorings was that the beginning of the RAPID programme? Yes, it was. So so the, the first um, 
Around about that time, the turn of the century, people were realising that there was the potential for the AMOC to change state very quickly, mm. hence the name RAPID. Mm. It was the idea <laughs> that there was a rapid change in the AMOC, yeah. <laughs> which might produce a rapid change in climate. Um, and so it became the RAPID Array. And it's um, mainly implemented by um, the UK, but we're partners in the US as well. Okay. And so, yeah, it's been we've been doing that uh, now for 20 years. It's a massive effort, actually. It's a really yeah. big programme because you have to keep going once a year. You go out, you haul, you haul in the moorings mm -hmm. that you laid out <laughs> the previous time, and then you, re, you reset them, you lay, relay them again. Um, and it is quite a big effort. It's a big engineering challenge. Um, and sorry, is that is that... Um the rapid arrays, is that just at 26 degrees north? Yeah, so it's in the subtropical North right. Atlantic. And the reason we chose that location was because that's where the ocean is transporting the most amount mm -hmm. of heat. So what that means is that we knew it's only ever, we call it an estimate of the AMOC actually, because yeah. <laughs> you know that you're never completely measuring it. Yeah. Um, but it, because it's the heat that um, transported by the ocean that we're interested in measuring, if you go where the signal is strongest, mm. you have the chance of, um, you have the best chance of getting a good estimate of what that is. Yeah. But then 10 years ago, actually we realized um, well, a, a little bit more than 10 years ago, we realized that measuring it in one place doesn't tell you about the AMOC along the whole of the, mm -hmm. the North Atlantic. And so we implemented an, a second array, which we call OSNAP, mm -hmm. um, in the subpolar North Atlantic. So it's between Canada, Greenland and Scotland. And that's the area where the overturning itself is actually happening, where the mm -hmm. water the warm water at the surface is cooling, it's releasing its heat to mm -hmm. the atmosphere, it's getting denser, it's sinking, and then it's forming that return flow of the overturning. And actually, so the fact that RAPID worked 20 years ago, after the first two or the first four years of, of data, um, that sort of really proved that this approach to measuring the AMOC worked, and that inspired then the um, implementation of other arrays in other places, mm. and OSNAP in the subpolar North Atlantic is one of them. There are also arrays in the South Atlantic as well. Mm, okay, but the rapid array is, is kind of the most long, the longest time series we have at the yes. moment. Yes, and you just mentioned there about twenty years ago. So is it the twentieth anniversary this year? Yes, it is the twentieth <laughs> anniversary um, this year. Wow. It's an incredible achievement. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. We're that's very amazing. proud of that. Yeah. Um, so as you may have heard from our previous episodes, um, there is speculation that the AMOC may slow down in future um, from the impact of climate change. Is there any ev evidence to suggest this from the rapid array or, or any of the other arrays? Yeah, it's a massively important question because um, as you talked about previously, mm. all the climate models suggest that under continued greenhouse gas emissions, the AMOC slows down and that has a really big impact on our climate system. Um, and so, but but the but the rapid array itself actually shows evidence that that in that twenty year period uh, period there hasn't been a slowdown there hasn't been an overall slowing mm. of the AMOC. It's it's actually really hard to draw a conclusion in a way because yeah. the ocean changes all the time. Okay, so it changes on short time scales, sort of seconds to minutes to days to months to year. And what we're looking for is the signal that might be changing over several years or several decades. Mm. And so unpicking that signal from all the noise of all the other variations is really hard to do. Yeah. So 20 years is almost not long enough to mm. say whether the AMOC's slowing down, but it's better than no information at all. The, the other way that we've been, that people have tried to estimate whether the, um, or tried to s sort of see whether the AMOC has slowed down or yeah. not, is to use what you might consider to be circumstantial evidence. Um, you might look at um, a, a, a parameter, a quantity in the ocean that you think would change as the AMOC slows down. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's, you know, the surface temperature in the subpolar North Atlantic or something. And you look and see how that's changed over time. And you can sort of say, well, when it's colder there, maybe that means the AMOC has slowed down. Um, and and so that, that, but that approach only takes you so far. So for some, some pieces of that circumstantial evidence do suggest the AMOC has slowed down, but other analyses of slightly different circumstantial evidence mm. suggest that it actually hasn't slowed down. Mm. So without the, we have that, this is one of the reasons we have to keep measuring it because yeah. we can't yet say for sure that it's slowed down yeah. um, and Rapid says it hasn't slowed down over yeah. 20 years. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's an important point because I remember when I started my PhD here, I think, yeah, 10 years ago now, um, everyone was getting really excited because there was a sudden dip in the AMOC. Um, but I think it bounced back the year after. Um, so that just shows how variable it is, right? 
Yeah, and so one one of the um, the early conclusions from the rapid array mm. was just how surprisingly variable mm. <laughs> the strength of the AMOC was. Yeah. Uh, we were, you know, when we saw that dip, which was a really big dip, um, it did sort of ring alarm bells. Mm. Um, but as you say, the, the ocean bounced back. It was a temporary mm. yeah. response to a change in the wind fields and, mm. and, and everything went back to normal after that. So there's that, would, that sort of happened over a period of a few months. Mm. And then we can also see periods of a few years where it's yeah. higher and where it's lower. Yeah. Um, so we have 20 years of data. Just how many years do you think we need to reliably conclude that it's changing? Because um, in the Atlantic, we do have multi-decadal variability, don't we? So We do. And it's a, that's a hard question Tricky. to answer. <laughs> yeah. And no funding agency is going to be happy if you say, I need to keep you know, know. doing AMOC for 50 years. Just keep going. But, but, but the reality is we do have to keep yeah. going because we don't know when it's going to slow down. Mm. And, and so we, we'll only find that out by keeping on measuring it. Mm. So um, the challenge for us is to see if we can be more efficient in the way mm. we're measuring the AMOC yeah. for a base, you know, uh, and we've already done that, but the rapid array is slightly different to how it, it was. Um, when it was first set up, just we've sort of removed the bits that we don't really need. Um, so, so that's the challenge. And then the other thing is that we do measure the AMOC in just a few places. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not a sort of nice continuous yeah. system. And so the challenge is to measure the AMOC a little bit more efficiently mm -hmm. and effectively and mm -hmm. in more places mm -hmm. um, without, without asking for loads of more money to do it. Yes, yeah. because that it isn't going to happen. Yeah. Is there a way to use um, ocean models to try and make that whole process a bit more efficient and effective? Yeah, and that, and that's key, I think. Mm. Um, as, as well as the, the interesting thing about RAPID is that as well as us telling us how the ocean, the AMOC is changing mm. over time, what it also does is um, help us understand how the AMOC works. And every time we learn a little bit more about the physics of how it works, mm. we can improve our models. Mm. We can use that information to make them mm. a little bit better. And so our models are all the time getting closer and closer to mm. being able to represent what the AMOC is doing at the moment. Um, and so some combination of, of observations and data, whether it's from the array or from other programs and models is, is the future really, I think, for us to be um, able to have a clearer view of whether the AMOC is slowing down. Yeah. So how much can it really tell us about the impact that climate change is having? Um, I know you said we've been changing the ways we're measuring it to make it a bit more efficient, but is there anything else we can do to make sure we can capture as many changes as possible? Um, I think that, like I say, measuring in different places, yeah. so we get a, a fuller view. Um, measuring in the very deepest parts of the ocean mm. is the challenge. I think we have various ways of measuring. The sat satellite uh, observing programs can measure the surface of the yeah. ocean. We have these things called floats, which are relatively small little mini robots that s sort of scoot around the ocean and they mm. measure the top 2000 meters. But actually for the overturning circulation, the deeper layers of the ocean really matter because that's where the dense uh, mm. waters are and changes in that deep layer can really um, have a profound impact on the state of the AMOC. But we don't have very me many measurements mm. from there. It's really, we still need ships and mm. these moorings. So there's a lack of data in the deep ocean, which is right. holding us back a little bit at the moment. Mm. Is there any particular location that you think we'd really benefit from some extra monitoring? Um, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I yeah, the deep ocean. Um, the mm. o the other the other thing that um, part of the story of a slowing down of the AMOC is the impact of melting freshwater, yeah. me melting ice, yeah. like the Greenland ice sheet, for example. And adding extra fresh water to the surface of the ocean has the potential, we think, to disrupt mm. the process of that warm surface water cooling and, and becoming denser and sinking. And so more measurements where that fresh water is coming off Greenland how, and the sort of shelf, the shallow shelf areas around Greenland and Canada and North America, where it might be making its way into the middle of the ocean. Yeah. Those are the places where we could do with more measurements mm. so we can see what's happening there and we can spot those changes early mm. before they um, sort of reveal themselves mm. in the AMOP. Yeah. And what's the future for the RAPID program? Well, the future is, is looking good. good. I mean, we, it's part of our, it's, it's sort of become part of our sustained observing program. We, um, we always have to give a convincing case for why that, 
the funding should continue for mm-hmm. all our sustained observing programs but it's sort of wrapped up into that um, set of other other observing yeah. that we do which makes it um, which makes its future a little bit more secure but like I said all the time we're trying to find ways to measure the AMOC more e- efficiently mm. more effectively one of the things we're looking at is how we get data back from the moorings more quickly than we have done at the past previously we, we wait for the ship to go out yeah. recover the moorings download the data mm. spend actually quite a long time uh, quality control yeah. the data it's, <laughs> it's really not very glamorous um, but it, and it takes time so we're looking at ways to develop how we can send data back more quickly mm-hmm. so we can get a quicker more timely view of what the of the ocean is doing mm. and a slightly more practical question how long does it take that one cruise to go and retrieve all the data from all the moorings uh, yeah, well, so when, when we did the whole width of the Atlantic at the mm. same time, yeah. it would take several weeks. I think yeah. the cruises typically were about five weeks, four, yeah. five, six weeks long. Um, now we we do the Western Atlantic separately okay. to the Eastern Atlantic and the cruises are more like three weeks long. Okay, that's more manageable. <laughs> yeah, it is a bit more manageable. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool, okay, final question uh, that we've asked all of our guests um, for this series. So in your opinion... What needs to happen to protect the AMOC and ensure it continues to regulate our climate? Yeah, it's it's a good question. And the first answer is always, of course, the obvious one that that we collectively as, uh, you know, humanity, we have to um, we have to work quicker to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. The the only way really practically to protect the AMOC, which is your question, is to just stop, you know, stop contributing to to -hmm. climate change. I think, though, for us as a community, as a research community, and those people who are interested in observing how the ocean is changing, um, just keeping on measuring the AMOC so that we can tell people how it's changing Mm. and maybe even recognise the point at which it really does begin to slow significantly Mm. so that people can be prepared. Society is going to need to adapt. If the AMOC slows, it changes the weather all around the Atlantic. So rainfall in the Amazon, rainfall in West Mm. Africa, what are, what are you know how warm and sunny our yeah. <laughs> summers are going to be and we need to adapt to that so protecting the AMOC starts with people understanding how important it is and how important changes are yeah. and then what we can do to reduce the change by changing our behaviors mm-hmm. in terms of greenhouse gas emissions yeah. brilliant well thank you so much for joining us today oh you're welcome thank, thank you, you. To find out more about Knox research into the AMOC or to check out the other episodes from this mini-series, visit our website, knock.ac.uk. If you'd like to listen to more of our podcasts, both seasons of Into the Blue are available on our YouTube channel on all major podcast platforms. See you next time.